visualizing the the discussion a little bit. Um, okay. The let, let, let me say first of all who we are. Uh, I'm Vance Stevens and Al Ain, United Arab Emirates, and this is Learning Together, uh, LearningTogether.net, and um, this is something we do every week. This week we're doing it on Monday, the 20th of June, and we're very happy to have with us here uh, three authors or compilers, you might say, uh, uh, co uh, curators of uh, a discussion group that published its results in uh, the TESOL EJ. TESL uh, -E Electronic Journal, and the article is called Teacher Practitioner Research Reflections on an Online Discussion, and they uh, decided to publish this in the uh, on the internet column, and I'm the editor of that column, so I got to read and reread the paper, and I found it uh, quite intriguing, the, the directions that they took this discussion. So, I'll, and, and the authors are Mark Wyatt. Ann Burns and Judith Hanks, and they're all here. We're also joined by Bushra and Martine. And we appreciate your uh, being here. And we have two viewers in the online stream. So if you want to ask any questions, if you're online and you're just watching the stream, you can go to chatwing.com, chatwing.com slash Vance S V A N C E S T E V, sorry, Vance Dev. Uh, and uh, if you chat with us there, uh, then everybody in the stream and in the Hangout as well will be able to follow along and communicate with each other in the chat. So I'll put that link in the uh, the uh, Hangout text area, but please use the text, the chat wing text in order to communicate so that everybody in the Hangout and in the stream will be able to communicate together. So with that brief introduction, um, Thank you very much, Mark and Anne and Judith, for joining us on Learning Together. Um, and Mark, as you were saying, how would you like to begin? Okay, well, perhaps thank you very much, Vance, for that. And it's it's uh, wonderful to be joining with joining you on on, on Learning Together. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I thought, well, when we discussed a little bit together, we we thought we might um, structure the uh, the discussion to a certain extent around the questions that we structured the article around. Um, but maybe if we could may perhaps just begin by providing a little bit of background information um, with regard to the article. Um, the article of course came out of an, an online discussion conducted through Yahoo groups and it's, um, it's a discussion group that is connected with the IATEFL uh, Research Special Interest Group, um, which has which has had a um, a discussion forum for about five years. It was started actually originally by Richard Smith, who was then the coordinator. Um, the practice initially was that often uh, researchers would be invited to. Um, to discuss one of their articles with, um, with 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 members of the group, and come up with a number of come up with a number of kind of guiding questions really to facilitate that. Then, kind of over time, um, we we developed alternative formats, including um, having kind of independent moderators, so people who uh, were discussing articles that they hadn't written, which created a little bit of distance sometimes in a way which was quite helpful. Um, we also started to link some of the discussions more closely to events. And uh, the, 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 the discussion that this, this article relates to um, teacher practitioner research, it also relates to a conference that was being carried out in, um, in June last year at which Judith, Anne, and myself were plenary speakers. Um, and there was a strong kind of conference theme, really, to the, to the discussion. The two articles that we, we discussed, um, they both actually appeared in a journal called ELT Research, which is produced by the ITEFL Research SIG. Um, the authors of those discuss discussions, the, the authors of those articles were both going to be at the conference, Richard Smith and Yasmin Dahl. And Richard's article was actually about how the conference had developed 
um, led by um, by 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 Kenan, who's a uh, a, a very very active uh, encourager of teacher practitioner research in Turkey. So that's just a little bit of background information. I don't know if Anne or Judith would like to, to add. Um, yes, I might add a little bit to what Mark has said. I think what was very um, uh, interesting about both the discussion and the conference was that there was a very sort of eclectic view taken of teacher or practitioner research. So it was really interesting to bring together different strands of um, areas that people have been interested in over time in relation to the idea of teachers or practitioners doing research in their own context. So whereas I think some of the conferences in um, in previous times had really focused very strongly on perhaps what was could be called action research in the conference, which was uh, which led up, which to which the article led up. Um, there were also there was, it also included um, <coughs> exploratory practice um, lesson plan. You might lesson you study. Might, lesson study. Lesson. That's right. Lesson study. Action research. So it was a really really broad overview of or reflective practice also. So it was a very broad take, if you like, on what could generally be called practitioner research. And I think this led to quite a number of interesting issues coming up in the online discussion where people were um, were, were debating and, and exchanging ideas about what the scope of practitioner research might mean and what might be appropriate or useful for teachers in different kinds of situations. So I think that we were trying to capture some of that in the article and in some of the questions that emerge from the article. So, uh, you know, that, that's what I found very interesting about both the, the article of the debate um, and also the conference itself. Yeah, if I can just add to what Anne was saying, I, I don't know if you can hear me, um, nod your heads if you can, <laughs> um, but what I, what I thought was quite exciting was um, both in the um, discussion, the online discussion leading up to the conference, where I think we were all, all the contributors were kind of thrashing out ideas and really trying to grapple with notions of what is practitioner research, what, what counts as practitioner research, what do we do, why do we do it, um, and that led also into the conference itself, where as Anne says, so we had lesson study, we had exploratory practice, we had action research, um, uh, so a really, a, a very um, exciting mix of different people and different views, and I, I think um, at one point I was talking about this metaphor of a, of a family, and I, I quite like that, you know, that a family, with your family, you don't necessarily always agree, um, but you, ha you share certain values, you share certain histories, you share certain cultures. So I think, you know, we're, we're at the same time thinking of what we share and also making ourselves distinct. And I, I think that's quite a good thing, quite a healthy thing. So I'm, I'm going to mute now. I, I just to add again to what Judith and Mark have both been saying, I think one of the interesting things that started to come up in the article um, was that people were problematizing the idea of teacher research because um, I think we began to felt that this was a rather narrow or perhaps um, under examined idea that you know that the, the research that we were talking about, should be labelled uh, teacher research, and we we were coming more and more to the idea that perhaps what we were talking about was more to do with research on practice, um, rather than just seeing teachers as the only people who could do research. You know, who were the people who could be practitioners or participants more broadly or more widely conceived of in the range or the scope 
of um, of activity that could be to do with researching or investigating what happens in practical teaching situations. So I also found that a very invigorating part of this online discussion that we were we were really beginning to sort of question or or um, redefine in a sense what it was that we felt was important to think about and to cover um, in the in the scope of the research that could be done because after all you know in exploratory practice there's a strong focus on students being participants in research I think in action research which I've always been very much an advocate for I've I've enjoyed seeing that or, or wanted to see that as not just the teachers but the people who are within their sphere of activity and that could be other teachers, it could be administrators, it could be students, it could be broader participants. So the idea of practitioners in the sense of everybody who's involved in the sort of phenomenon or the activity of teaching really appeals to me. Uh, Thank you. Bringing up the topic, oh sorry, I was just, just going to interject uh, the, in your article, I was, I was glad that um, uh, that um, Anne went into the different labels, there's teacher research, uh, practitioner research, action research, and then exploratory practice, which doesn't even have a label of research. Uh, these were all uh, threads that were developing in the article, which I, I found really interesting. And I, I also should point out that in the text chats, I've put the links to the article. So, um, and we've got Meg Ross, who's just checked in at Chatwing, and I'd like to welcome her. She's in the stream. We have three viewers in the stream. Uh, so, in order to chat with Meg and, and with the other people, can we please use the Chatwing link to uh, to do our text chats? And that's, I put the link to the chatwing.com slash V-A-N-C-E-S-T-E-V in the Hangout text chat, and I've also put the link to the article there, because of course it's going to be very useful for people to follow along in the article and see uh, exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I would like to welcome anyone who's in the Hangout already to unmute and speak if you wish. Uh, I don't think this is a presentation, this is a discussion, just like what the article reports on. And uh, anybody who's in the hangout, or, or sorry, in the chat wing, viewing the stream is also welcome to come into the hangout. We put the link there to the hangout. If you need it, just uh, tell us and we'll uh, paste it there for you. Okay, so anyway, uh, over to you, Mark. You were about to say something. Okay, no, just to thank you very much for that. Um, just to, to build a bit on what Anne said as well. Um, I mean, Anne has been to the conference actually in Turkey for the last, last two years now, I think. Um, and, and and the conference actually it's a conference that has been 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 running for about five years and there have been um, developments as as Kenan has pointed out in the way that teachers who have been engaging in research have been um, developing their understandings of research have, and, and there's been this progress within this context of teachers tending to involve their students much more working with their students to to a much greater sense as uh, so that the, the students are also involved as practitioners and I think that 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 when we kind of like get away with some of the labels that can be used sometimes to create unnecessary divisions when we look at this this term practitioner research we can see these great commonalities across different um, different different forms of practitioner research conducted in different contexts in different ways but linked by this empowering of teachers that is going on and empowering of learners um, the empowering of learners for example is very evident in in some of Judith's work um, and, and work for example conducted in Brazil we see this great empowering of, 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 of teachers in in, in, in Anne's work in Australia, we see um, we see these collaborative, um, exploratory action research type studies being conducted in in, in Chile. Um, 
So there's, there's, there seems to be there seems to be work in, in different contexts that is bringing teachers and learners together. That is that is that is really helping kind of all practitioners in the learning learning environment. There are, there there might be a diff, different emphasis in different areas, but we, we we see this kind of empowerment, which is um, which is really rewarding. And I think when we go to these when we when we've been to these conferences in Turkey, um, I think Anne has found this. Jude has certainly found this, and I have. How invigorating the whole thing is because you've got you've got this commitment to commitment to research, commitment to to practitioner research, really growing in these different communities. Yeah, I'd like to just um, sorry, Anne, mm -hmm. you can unmute. <laughs> you have to unmute yourself. I think you probably tried to unmute yourself and remute it. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, we heard you start, but then we saw you stop. Uh, yeah, I've been fiddling around. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. um, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, the the the, the um, conferences in Turkey have been of great value to me. But I, I, the excitement is not just for me experience in Turkey. I've um, I've worked for many many years with teachers in Australia, and I think Meg might even have been in one of the action research projects that I was involved in a few years ago. But I, I think that, that, that there's a sort of um, quite a long history of, you know, of teachers being quite inspired and excited by uh, being involved in action, in, in action research or, or research which we might call practitioner research more generally. Um, and I think that the important thing for me has always been that I've never bought into the idea that uh, teachers are uninterested in research. You know, there's a lot that's in the literature. There's a lot that seems to be assumed about the lack of interest in research. That hasn't actually been my experience for many years of working with teachers, particularly here in Australia, that once the opportunity is opened up for teachers to become detectives, or explorers or investigators of their classrooms it's um, it's a kind of magical journey you know as uh, some teachers I worked with last year said it was like it was like a playground of research where they could actually go into their playground or their classroom and try out really new and creative things so I, I, I get very excited by the idea of teachers in whatever locations they're working in doing some form of practice which is reflective, which is exploratory, which investigates issues that are very close to their hearts and which they really get very excited about because they learn a lot more about it. And where you can bring in learners as well, um, that's extremely important. And a lot of the teachers that I've worked with here have always or very strongly made the point that in fact, what happens is that they become much more deeply engaged with their learners and in turn the learners are also very empowered by the kind of experiences that they're sharing together in these kinds of uh, investigations. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it, really, it really opens up the whole, the whole scope for many teachers. Uh, one interesting part of the article, I'm just skimming through it, and uh, in, in the area where you're talking about the difference between action research and exploratory practice, uh, it seems to hinge upon a difference between a problem and a puzzle. Can you explain that? I'm not sure if, you, if I've unmuted or not, have I? Okay, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll have a go at that question since it's been something that's been puzzling me for about, um, well, since 1997, so um, I still haven't found a perfect answer, but it's certainly something that, that continues to interest me. 
Um, I think one of the things that exploratory practice is very, very determined about is, is this um, attempt to work for understanding rather than leaping to um, problem solving. And that's not to say that this doesn't happen in action research as well, I'm sure it does. But I think in, in our whole society actually, we have been kind of seduced by problem solving. We, we are naturally, as, as people, I think we, we are problem solvers. You see a problem, you want to solve it. Um, but a little bit like, um, I think it's Kahneman's idea of slow thinking, I think we frequently with our fast thinking brains, we leap to obvious solutions. But we don't take the time to step back, slow down, and really think deeply about questions that puzzle us. And so, um, for example, a sort of classic example is why, why don't my students speak in English in the English language classroom? Why are they continually using their mother tongue? And you can see lots and lots of different ways of trying to solve that problem. And people have spent many years doing that. But it doesn't answer the question of why do they use their mother tongue? So for me, the fact that exploratory practice places this heavy emphasis on why, why do they do it, it kind of releases you from the problem-solving paradigm. So you can spend some time really investigating, well, why, why do you use your mother tongue? Why do I use, why do I sometimes use my mother tongue in a foreign language classroom? Could there be times when it's a good thing to use the mother tongue? And so on and so on. So you can, you can actually step back from the lure of the solution and, um, and spend some time really working to understand why things are as they are in the classroom. So I'm going to hand over to Mark and to Anne in case they have something to add to that. Could I just interject again? Uh, it, I hope you're following the chat wing chat because there are some comments and uh, even questions coming up there. Uh, Bushra is with us from Pakistan. And she says, she's made two comments. One says, I think teachers are interested in research in Pakistan, but they need help in understanding the process. And then she says later, I think in AR, uh, action research, the first step is to develop understanding of the context and the issue slash puzzle problem the researcher intends to investigate. Do you agree? Question. So there are other comments there you might want to uh, follow as you're, as you're talking. So do you agree with Basha? I'm wondering if Mark wants to interject at this point. I, I could say a lot about this, but <clears throat> I, 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 feel, I feel we need to give some space to each other. Um, I think what I, what I would say about this is that, um, I mean, action research is a, very, is a very broad term. It's been around for a long time, and there are many different interpretations of action research. Um, the action research that um, that Anne has been involved in for many for many many years in Australia for, for over twenty years. Um, from everything I've read about it in those in those decades, is that it's always been very deeply principled. There's always been this focus on sustainability. There's always been this focus on exploring issues, there's been this focus on, on problematizing, gaining a deeper, getting a deeper, deeper grasp of the situation. Um, and, some, and, and, and as she's often said as well, that it's not really about changing things, um, it's about 
getting a getting a broader understanding, getting a deeper understanding. So I think there's a kind of commonality here in in forms of action research. Certainly, the, the kind of action research that that Anne has been involved in and exploratory practice. And that there is this focus on on seeking to understand, and I think that that is so essential. Um, I think that one of the one of the really good things about the the development of exploratory practice is that there has been this focus on important principles, on key principles, such as um, improving the quality of life, working for understanding. That is so essential that you work for understanding. But that, but as Judith has also said, you know, as Judith said actually in the discussion in the article, that is also true of other forms of of practitioner research as well. So, I mean, personally, I believe it's very, very important to 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 work for understanding. And I know that um, that, that both Judith and Anne do feel that very strongly as well too. Mm. Uh, we've all gone mute, <laughs> so just to just to say, <laughs> I was going to hand over. Uh, I would just I would just add though that um, that sometimes you do see you know and there was reading something produced by a um, but by a student not that long ago that that revealed a kind of like an understanding of of action research which is just a million miles away. From the kind of action research that Anne has been involved in, um, so, <laughs> but we are all focused very much on working for understanding. Yeah, I think. Um, oh, sorry, Anne. Uh, sorry, can I just I just add a little bit to what Mark has been saying? I think um, I think because action research includes the term research, it trails behind it a kind of possibility of an almost a positivistic approach to thinking about what it actually is. And in uh, traditional research methodologies, um, the term problem is extremely common, you know, I mean, um, uh, people who are doing research, researchers are advised to find a problem that they can investigate. And they're advised to collect, you know, very traditional forms of data and they're advised to pro to um, provide um, a literature. And they're advised to collect, you know, very traditional forms um, Yeah, so, sorry, can you still hear me? So, so can you hear me? Yeah. So I think that I think that there's an unfortunate sort of um, um, sort of long tail, if you like, of remnants from the view of research that is is quite traditional. And I have seen uh, publications and versions of research reports, which I don't think are terribly appealing to other teachers or other practitioners. They they um, they move towards trying to replicate what might be seen as quite traditional forms of reporting research. And I keep striving very, very strongly to, 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 to shift the, um, the continuum, if you like, towards something which I think are more acceptable ways of both approaching the research and also reporting the research uh, so that other teachers will be interested in what what is being found out and can share that with their colleagues. So um, I think this idea of problem is very unfortunate. And if you read some of the original literature on action research, it decidedly says that in fact action research is not problem solving. It's it's much deeper and richer than that. And I keep struggling <laughs> against this sort of assumption. Uh, which seems to keep cropping up that it really is, you know, a very simplistic kind of I have a problem and I'm going to change and find the solution. And I, um, in the work that I've been trying to do, I really try to attempt to sort of shift things away from that, that interpretation as much as I can. Oh, I can see Meg on the screen. 
Yeah, I'd completely agree with Anne there. And just thinking back to what um, Bushra's original question was about the process of research, I think that speaks quite a lot to Simon Borg's work when he um, asked teachers, what, what are your conceptions of research? What do you think about research? It does seem that there is a, again, sort of going back to a society-wide idea of what research is, that it's large scale, that it involves crunching huge numbers of data, it's got to be um, it's got to be rigorous, it's got to be uh, replicable, it's got to be all of these things which come very much from, as Anne says, from the positivist paradigm. But there's so much more that we could be doing. So much more um, sort of inventive, creative, exciting forms of research, which which are really not within that paradigm at all. But it, it takes some time to get that idea accepted. Even people who who I've worked with over the last ten years, who <laughs> having worked with me, you might you might think that they would be aware of the different possibilities of research. But even some of them have have said. Oh, but it, it's not really research if it's not large scale. And even very experienced researchers say, well, if it doesn't involve 500 schools with 7,000 students, it doesn't count. I just think that is so wrong. Um, so what's exciting, I think, is, is what can we do to challenge those stereotypes? What can we do to investigate creative ways of doing research and creative ways of sharing research. I think the, the article that we put together, one of the first questions was about sharing and how we share, what, what methods do we use to share and, and who do we share with. So maybe, maybe um, people want to continue to discuss that. I'm just looking at the time by the way, I've got about 15 minutes before I have to go so, <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm just giving you a heads up on that one. Uh, one of the things about sharing was if the article, if the research is not shared, is it research? If it's not I published, you know, or, uh, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think so, um, published in what form? You know, so we've, we've got very traditional forms of um, books and journal articles, but the, the, uh, the forum that um, we've just worked with you, this is, this is a, an alternative form, so doing it through the web. Richard Smith also has been doing a lot of work in finding different ways of disseminating research and the research that people have been doing. I think that's, you know, with, with the internet we've got so much more that we could do that goes hand in hand with but also beyond uh, the traditional article, journal article or book. Can you give an example of one of the more imaginative ways of sharing research that's, um, you know, outside the, the, the standard, the norm? Uh, well, if I'm thinking about exploratory practice, so one of the things that they do in Rio de Janeiro, the exploratory practice group there, they have a, a learners and teachers conference. So it's not just uh, academics, although they're also welcome, it's also the teachers, teacher educators, learners themselves, and they all present together. Uh, it's usually done through poster presentations, but I saw a fantastic talk by um, one young woman, uh, Clarissa, I think it was, who talked about how she had she she made a dress out of her PhD thesis. So she wore her thesis, which I just think that's fantastic. I'd like to invite uh, anyone else to unmute. I see Meg is unmuted. Maybe she wants to say something. I also see that Anne was about to say something. So you're welcome to unmute and speak to us, please. Yeah. Uh, I think I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I just wanted to mention probably the best conference talk experience I've ever had, which was to... Um, in teaching a third year university subject, my co-teacher, who was quite young and inexperienced, but 
expert in the field of animal science, we got um, we asked for volunteers amongst our third year students for anyone who'd like to work with us on preparing a conference talk. And we had one of the students, third year undergraduate, and the three of us did a presentation a um, couple of months, um, well, two or three months after the end of semester on a model we were using for, for, um, for teaching. And the preparation of that talk and then rehearsing it because all three of us gave a little segment of this 20 minute talk was probably one of the best learning experiences I've had and the, one of the big things was that it wasn't us two lecturers talking about what we did and what impact it had and everything else. It, it, it was actually the three of us together constructing that story about the model and, and its impact and this uh, young guy was very connected, very perceptive, uh, very connected to the other students and kept checking with the other students um, to make sure he was sort of keeping things on the right track. And so all of the students indirectly through him kept us two on track and uh, we, ha we had a very enthusiastic response to it. So it was participant uh, and, and practitioner research. Yeah, so if you don't mind, um, just leading on from that, I'm thinking about uh, Yasmin Dar, who who wrote one of the initial uh, journal articles, um, newsletter articles, which st sparked off the whole uh, online discussion. She also um, at a at a, com a I think it was a IATFL Resig event in Leicester in 2012. She um, she had her two of her students who actually joined her as part of the presentation. So again, something that is, is very, very exciting. It's kind of sharing it, but in a different way. Um, also at um, the conference in Izmir last year, I think it was Koray who, um, who invited two of his students. And these, I mean, the people in Rio particularly, but also Koray's students, these are quite young people. They are, they are not kind of... <laughs> they're not of the sort of older generation. They are they are young and excited by research and excited by the possibilities that they can contribute to it. That people will listen to them. Which again, I think I think this is one of the the sort of uplifting things about this type of practitioner research. Hmm. I just add a little bit from um, the experiences in Australia. The um, the teachers who come in here have usually never done research or presented their research before. And at the end of the year, we have a joint workshop where they all um, prepare presentations, which are done in a sort of colloquium format at um, the major conference here for English Australia, which is the professional body they work with. And um, that's really exciting because they they get a chance, they actually rehearse their presentations with each other and they have only about 10 minutes each. So they really have to synthesize their research into the sort of magical nuggets, you know, at the center of it. And they give each other a lot of feedback. So there's a lot of sort of peer sharing and collaboration that goes on around this research and opportunities to, to share and um, then they, they presented in a colloquium format. But the thing that has really struck me about this is that even though they only have a very short time to present their research, um, that seems to be a sort of springboard for many of them to go on to do other kinds of presentations. And I've been quite astounded looking back over some of the people who've been part of this that you know some of them are up to their 10th or 15th presentation now and this is both internationally and nationally and it ranges from a whole lot of formats from giving uh, their colleagues um, information or updates at staff meetings right out to the sort of full conference presentation so I think that the the exciting thing about this kind of practitioner research is that the possibilities are endless. You can really, um, and, you, and you're not constrained 
in the way that a lot of academic researchers are into a very typical or traditional kind of way of presenting the research. It can be anything from poster presentations to, you know, wearing your research to acting out your research or creating a poem about your research, singing. I don't know. I think anything that appeals to other practitioner researchers is really um, up there for, for grabs. So I find that particularly exciting about the way things can be publicized. Yeah, um, can I add something? Sure. Please. Um, Mark, go ahead. I'll take the next turn. Okay. No, just very briefly, I was just, just building on the, the, the point actually that uh, that Anne made about creative ways of sharing research. Um, and Judith actually mentioned Richard Smith, who, well, co-editor of ELT Research, um, published um, cartoons as research, um, and is current and has been um, co-editing a book on innovative ways of. Oh, oh, sorry, not a book, a special issue of LTED that will be coming out in December of creative ways of writing about research, and this will include examples of poetry. Um, so yes, lots and lots of creative possibilities. Also, acting out research, singing as well. Yes, I think it's really good to to break down break down the boundaries and uh, let creativity thrive. Really. Bushra, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Judith. Uh, I just thought I'd share with you one of the ways I used to. Uh, share my research with not only for te with teachers but act generally in public in Pakistan and what I did was uh, to submit a piece of article based on my research on promoting uh, engaging learners in large classes in a local newspaper which is dawn and and I it was beyond my imagination when I published it the, the kind of response I got on it uh, I noticed that educators, parents, teachers, students actually wrote to Dawn to find out who am I, what am I doing. They were more interested in finding about my research, probably because I used a medium which was very easily accessible to the public. And it did kind of created an impact, which I didn't think of actually before doing it. Uh, but I think that could be one, one of your local means, um, a new national newspaper or any local means of reaching out to public. Uh, which can create a lot of ripples and which can create a dialogue within the community and within the country. Um, I've just sent the link to that uh, newspaper article I'm talking about here um, on the chat wing. Thank you. And I thought that was personally very empowering for me because I began to see that dialogue is possible without uh, publishing through typical academic means of, you know, publication. Yeah, if I can just add to that, um, I'm just thinking about uh, two two different uh, aspects of sharing. And one is um, a friend of mine was uh, recommending to me uh, there's a PhD thesis, in fact, which has been done as a graphic novel, which I'm absolutely de desperate to get hold of. I really want to see this this PhD as a graphic novel. Um, so that's one um, exciting and creative way of doing things. And the other thing, um, my colleague <clears throat> Jess Poole um, is investigating at the moment. Um, we'll hopefully be talking about it um, next week in uh, Istanbul. Is um, thinking about ways in which we can utilize uh, online apps, online activities uh, as a way of sharing research, of disseminating what we've been doing. So we're at the moment talking about the possibility of one of those little, um, I forget what it's called, it's called something like a padlet I think, where um, you you talk and you you don't see the photograph of the person or, or the video of the person but you see a video of some line drawings or, or, or comments which are uh, unfolding in a sort of uh, flickery sort of way uh, as you speak and again I think this is this is really full of possibility the other thing I just wanted to say as well is that um, just going back to this idea of sort of very traditional ideas of what research is and how to disseminate research Research, it tends to fall back onto a, a, a very limited idea of um, a traditional scientific model. But actually, if you look at the sort of cutting edges of science, if you look at 
I don't know, particle physics or really, really um, very far out there kind of science, you see that people there are not following these um, traditional notions. They're doing much more creative work. And I think we can, we can broaden our interpretation of science to go beyond that sort of very old-fashioned model of, you know, got to have large numbers of questionnaires, got to have lots of data, got to have um, um, lots of um, statistics. Um, but actually to say, no, it, it's the interpretation that really, really matters. I think, um, I think using visual forms is also potentially very appealing too. Um, some teachers I worked with here in, in Melbourne, um, they were all working within the same college and in fact their college asked them to make a video of their research. So each of the teachers who had been involved had, you know, a few minutes talking about their research on video and that was made available through the website for the college so other people could come in and actually just, just have a sort of a brief overview of their research, um, hear about their ideas and then perhaps think about how they could take up some of those ideas for themselves in their own classrooms. In that particular college, the teachers also produced posters and the posters were then displayed in the corridors so that other teachers could, could see them and, and get a sense of what had been done. So I think, you know, visual, other visual forms, and I'm sure that technology can lend itself to lots of other ways of, of uh, bringing uh, research into a more visual sphere or multimedia kind of sphere. Uh, and I'm not I'm not sure, quite sure what they are, but I'm sure they're there somewhere. Okay, um, I've got about uh, one more minute before I have to go. We have our external exam board today, so I'm very sorry I'm going to have to go in a moment, but um, Mark, did you want to add something? I'd just like to say, yes, it's, it's great. I mean, there are so many wonderful opportunities, and it's really good that things are, things are changing. It's, it, I mean, it takes time. A lot of changes take time, and, and to change mindsets about research, it, it needs people, um, it needs people like you and Anne and others to, to carry on um, sharing the ideas that research is something for everyone, and it can be done in all sorts of creative, wonderful ways involving um, all practitioners of learning. So I think there are lots of exciting possibilities, but it's also a lot of hard work to, to keep helping to get people involved and helping to create networks, really, that, that, that will support um, practitioners engaging in research and, and help them see how, how wonderful it is. But it, it, it does need a lot of support. And uh, just, uh, just <coughs> to go back to the idea of, um, you know, traditional research, I think when you think about research traditions, um, scientific research is so well established in itself. Qualitative research is less well established and there are still sceptics and doubters. Action research is way out there as being pretty alternative still for a lot of people. So it's not surprising in a sense that we're having these kinds of conversations where, you know, we're in a, in a sphere where we're really pushing the boundaries of what gets seen as research and what gets accepted as research. And I think the discussions around all of this are so exciting but also challenging at the same time as we try to work through questions about you know what counts as research in this kind of practitioner sphere and how can we gain uh, atten attention for it through the ways in which it's publicized so that it isn't isn't uh, demonized or marginalized and I don't really know what the answers are but I think we're at the beginning of a very um, exciting process trying to figure it all out. Yeah, I, I like the approach that... Oh, go ahead, Meg. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say maybe maybe in um, 
some of our national conferences, you know, we need to have a experiment with things like having a stream of action research, you know, within a within a, a, a broader field. I mean, if in applied linguistics, for example, I'm not sure that I've ever seen a stream called action research or participant research, um, and I'm I'm not sure in the um, TESOL or English Australia or places like that where it, if if there's a space for you know some more senior people than than myself, um, some of the more senior people to have the influence to start something like that, and because uh, in terms of support and uh, acknowledgement of, of value, then uh, things like that start to, uh, I think, shape shape things. And the other thing would be in um, uh, in teachers who are who are fortunate enough to have uh, more ongoing sort of jobs rather than very short contracts. If if um, you know professional development um, in people's performance being evaluated, if contributions, if presentations and talks and various sort of presentations are, are given more weight or more um, uh, acknowledgement or credit, then I, I think that would be um, encouraging for people, to, for senior people to say, you know, to really um, reward in, 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 even just in a verbal way. The, the efforts people make in those areas. Yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with you, Meg. Mm. You know, I mean, it's still almost unheard of to have a teacher researcher conference. Um, I think the conference in Turkey sort of comes close to that. It's come, and and uh, the ITA for uh, research so has certainly done a huge amount to promote it, but. To be frank, I think that there's still a long way to go within TESOL, for example. Um, TESOL still doesn't have um, a strong orientation towards teacher research and doesn't really include strands on teacher research in its program, its convention program. Um, there isn't a lot of publication through the TESOL or particularly TESOL quarterly, of what you might call practitioner-based research. I, I did a, a search not very long ago for an article which was published in TESOL quarterly, and I went back over about 10 years of TESOL quarterly publications, and I, could, I couldn't find um, an article which was actually based on you know, practitioner or action research. I managed to find one which was sort of oriented towards it, but I think it's quite significant, even in our field still today, that these kinds of things are not available to teachers. So we still have a way to go, I think. Yeah, I'd agree. I think, you know, it is it is the beginning. It's well it's not the beginning, it's been going for a while, but it's but it's certainly at I Turtle where I think there's certainly um, there's certainly been progress in the last few years um, with the the conference in Turkey, which we found I think so invigorating because it is just about teacher practitioner research, um, and so it's a kind of it's 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 on a much larger scale than the kind of workshops that we might do with 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 teachers engaged in in forms of you know action research or exploratory practice. I mean it was really nice having a conference about about teacher research. And um, and one thing that's really good actually is that this year as well, um, IATEF has supported a conference in Latin America. So now there are two conferences around the world and that will become an annual event as well. So we've got a Latin American conference and we've got a conference in Turkey. And, um, and the conference in Turkey is of course getting larger. With, um, with with getting more, getting more international speakers and involving more people from around the country, and I'm sure the same thing will happen with the Latin American conference as well. So it's 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 still baby steps, but but getting there definitely.
Okay, is everyone still mute? <laughs> one of those, one of those silences. I think I need to leave in a moment as well, actually. Bounce and and a push. Yes, yeah, so I, so. I, I was unable to mute myself in time, unmute myself in time. But anyway, um, yes, we we have by the way six. Oh, we had six. We we're down suddenly to five viewers in the stream, but that's quite a nice stream. We've had a very active text chat in the chat wing. And uh, it's really nice that uh, Bushra and Meg joined us and uh, voiced their, uh, you know, bolstered our conversation with their presence. So I certainly appreciate Anne and Judith and Mark uh, spending their time with us and writing that article. This is an interesting, it's the first time actually I've, I've uh, had a Learning Together event following on an article that, uh, that appeared in the, on the internet column, but I think it's a really great idea. I think I should try to do this more often. It's really nice to meet the authors and uh, uh, follow up on the discussion, or, or I should say have a discussion, uh, following up on the article. So it's been uh, it's a really nice article. It was something unusual for on the internet, but and, and it broached the topic really. Uh, one thing that I was very interested in was the fact that you take it on, the, you're talking about sharing your research, sharing ideas, you take it uh, on the, you participate publicly in these discussions, and that is not comfortable for everybody. Mm. It's also something you need to teach uh, to teach your students. You know, so you need to make students comfortable in these online spaces because that's where we're headed. As you mentioned, if you're going to share research, you need networks, and uh, mm. networks are open; or they have to be. Any, any comments on that? Um, I, I'd say yeah. It's a it's a it's been a real learning experience. Um, it is a. Um, I think it's I think it is so important to move into these online spaces and to gain and to become more comfortable doing so. And um, we need to keep we need to keep learning. We need to keep learning about the new technology with our learners and and, and making use of it. Um, definitely, it's the te technology is is changing our world. So. I think we need to, 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 I mean, having this, being able to do this, uh, have this session with you here today, it's, um, that represents all kinds of technological advancements in the last, in the last decade in itself. So, yes, I think it's great to keep moving with the technology. Mm. Uh, I might just add to what Mark's just said that, um, thanks for the, your comments, fans, because, uh, it was certainly a lot of fun uh, being part of that that interaction. But interestingly, we're now involved in another uh, dis online discussion through the IRTF of Research SIG, which is actually looking at networks and creating networks around practitioner research. So that's um, that's that's potentially bringing up a whole lot of other interesting areas about the sustainability of research and the networking that can be done of people who are interested in uh, in this form of research. So that's been interesting too. Yeah, um, and so like one of the things, sorry, one of the things that came up, for example, in this discussion is the fact that um, through networks like this, it's possible to, of course, to reach all kinds of people and support people who who don't have access to support through face-to-face -face interaction. So it's, it's very, very valuable in that kind of way. Yeah, that's what Learning Together tries to do, is to you know, bring not, um, not the star uh, luminaries who, you know, to, who, who people often are, are featured in hosted uh, podcast events, but to bring people together um, of course, not to say that you're not stars and luminaries in your own right, but uh, I guess we all are. But that's the that's the point, you know, is to bring all these people who are not recognized so much uh, and bring them together and talk to each other. And and by the way, one such person, two of them, by the way, are in uh, in the chat wing. Maha Abdul Manim has checked in, and uh, Neve Torresi is uh, checked in. She's th these are both people in our uh, personal learning networks or in in the the networks, as you say, associated with learning together and webheads in action, and um, we seem to come together in MOOCs and things like that. 
And um, anyway, they've both been watching Mahasas for the last 20 minutes, and Neves has been uh, uh, watching also. And so it's uh, nice that we reach people not only in the stream, but also in the recording later. This is, of course, recorded. I hope that's okay with everybody. And uh, they're going to see the, the chat wing. The chat wing sort of lasts forever. And Maha says she'd love to take a look at some of the examples of innovative ways of sharing research. You know, a, that was one thing I was going to ask. I don't know if you have time, but have you? Is, is there something, an example of really innovative teacher research or practitioner research or exploratory practice or action research? Is there, is there one example that really sticks with you that you might want to just mention before we go? Um, well, for example, the um, there was a book actually published by uh, Deborah Bullock and Richard Smith, or sorry, edited by Deborah Bullock and Richard Smith that came out just last year that includes um, reports on poster presentations made by people at a at an IATF or a research SIG event where Anne was providing providing feedback, um, and so so this includes um, you know it includes the posters and it includes some commentary on the posters. That's one good example. Um, then there is a, a volume coming out in December this year. It's a volume of LTED, E-L-T-E-D, which is a publication from the University of Warwick. And that includes um, examples of innovative research writing, so including uh, poetry, for example, about, about research experience. Those are two, two things. Um, and would you like to add? Well, at the risk of self-promotion, um, my book from 2010, on doing action research in English language teaching has a whole um, section um, in the last chapter on disseminating the research and in that book I suggest a number of different ways both written ways um, and oral ways of disseminating the research and visual also um, and so they're, they're, they're ideas and with some examples of how teachers have, have used them so that's another source of looking at at least at different ways that teachers might um, might um, think creatively about presenting their research. But that book was written, you know, several years ago. So I'm sure that things have moved on, and there are lots of new ideas that could come up about ways of presenting research creatively. But and I think we need to think in terms of that. I think we need to think about what the different purposes are in the ways that the research is presented. Um, you know, for me, there's a whole lot of reasons for doing action research, and it could range from you undertake action research for PhD study, which one of my students recently did last year, which requires a different form of writing from perhaps um, more innovative or creative ways that you might present for other practitioners which could be more sort of what you could call fun activities or fun presentations. So I think it's quite important to see it as a whole spectrum of ways of doing it according to the um, requirements for the audiences that you're working with. So, but I think the sky's the limit really as long as you have a, a good sense of, of who, you're, um, who you're presenting to. I'd be very grateful if you would paste the references you mentioned. Actually, in fact, Neve, Neve has uh, asked the title of the book. If you could go into the chatwing.com slash Vance Steve, V-A-N-C-E-S-T-E-V, and just paste the references or any references you think would be useful. If you could just paste them there, then we would preserve them forever, and they would also end up in our show notes. Uh, all these Hangouts, by the way, are uh, recorded, and they are posted uh, at learningtogether.net. That's learning together with a two in it. Learningtogether.net. And uh, this one will be posted there shortly, but as soon as we leave, the recording will be fixed in YouTube. It's being streamed right now, but streamed to the YouTube server. So uh, as soon as we leave, we stop the broadcast, then it gets put there. So you can find it in the in the conversation uh, that we set up in the in the Hangout event. However you got here, uh, there is a link somewhere to the uh, 
YouTube recording that will appear momentarily or whenever we leave. I never uh, really stop these broadcasts. I just let them sort of fizzle out. So um, if uh, when people stop talking uh, then and disappear, then I'll stop the broadcast. I might just say one day I used to work at the Petroleum Institute like Mark's doing, and I know that uh, and I, I used to kind of come in a little bit late, but I used to stay very late too. I don't know if Mark has discovered this, but I used to, uh, I am possibly the only one of the few people in the world who know that the lights are triggered at 8 p.m. That is, if you're there at 8 p.m., everything goes off and you have to get up and walk out in the hall, even to get light in your office. Everything is off. All it goes dark. You have to get out and walk around in order for the lights to come back on so you can exit the building. I don't know if you've discovered that yet, Mark. It, but just it's a secret between us, okay? Don't let it out. Everybody will be claiming that they. You, you have to actually be a night owl to be uh, to know that. Can I just add um, one thing about um, uh, the participants or the or the people doing the action research, and that is that I think uh, maybe uh, the more the merrier might be uh, uh, one one way of. Um, one aspect to, to think about. Um, I've worked a lot in the sciences and I, I um, certainly observe the phenomenon of uh, you know large number of authors of, of um, uh, research papers and I, I don't think in education and the humanities we've been so inclined to do that and I, I think there's a very nice um, team model um, that uh, is worth thinking about um, and myself and seven of my colleagues are, are about to launch into a, um, a team project and um, I think one of the things about action research is if, if there's a bunch of people involved in the action then um, you know joint authorship is, uh, is a great way to learn from each other and, and to actually produce something that is is quite rich to um, for other people to look at. Yes, I, I would really agree with that, Meg. I think, um, as you say, in the sciences, that there's a whole tradition of publishing with whole teams of people. But we tend to, well, I don't know. Perhaps it's the way the um, the uh, academic context is set up that people tend not to do that so much in the social sciences and, and in education but certainly I think from the point of view of practitioners wanting to start publicizing their research it's a great way to do it and perhaps even to do that with students uh, their students as well so that you know that, so that a range of participants are brought into it and um, and perhaps even different ways of presenting the experience could be included in the scope of an article so that different different styles or patterns of reporting it could be introduced as well. I think it would be very interesting. Sure. Okay, Mark, well, seems, no, Mark seems to have disappeared. Judith seems to have disappeared. <laughs> I don't know yes. if there are any other issues that people want to bring up on there. Um, any last questions in the chat wing? Uh, and I want to thank everyone for being here the 20th of June, uh, 2016. I always give the dates in my podcasts. And we're getting the more thank yous in the, in the chat wing chat. So the chat wing is at chatwing.com slash V-A-N-C-E-S-T-E-V and you'll find uh, the re this recording, the link posted at learningtogether.net shortly and um, you can, uh, if you go to learningtogether.net, click the about tab, you'll find the links to all our indexes and everything and uh, where you'll see the information that we've put up online uh, until it gets posted to learningtogether.net, the official blog. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Vance. Okay. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, nice thank to you. meet you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye bye.